welcome back to Image Seeker, where we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. We find the verse in the Bible that talks about this in Galatians 5.22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The first three characteristics that we've looked at so far are love, joy, and peace. We talked about the fact that the kind of love we're to have is not a feeling, it's a response. If we only love based on our feelings and our emotions, we probably aren't going to love the way the Lord wants us to love. The kind of love that we're supposed to have is a response to our obedience to Him. Now he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, what love really is. He says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We then looked at the fact that as Christians, we're to have joy in spite of our inadequacies. We're often robbed of true joy because we feel inadequate. We need to be reminded that we have been made by our Heavenly Father and that He delights in us. Psalm 67 says, Oh God, in mercy bless us. Let your face beam with joy as you look down at us. Our Father loves us because He is the one who made us and He takes delight in us. Also, as Christians, we're to have joy in spite of our circumstances. The Christian faith offers joy in the midst of happenings. When a Christian doesn't find joy on account of his happenings, he can always find joy in spite of them. We then looked at having peace, and and we found that we won't have the peace of God until we have peace with God. You see, it's impossible to have his peace dwelling in a heart that has unconfessed sin. Our relationship must be right with him before we can claim the promises from him. So the first thing we need to do, if we really want peace in our life, is to make sure we have confessed our sin to God and asked for His forgiveness. We will never have true peace until we do that. The Lord wants to pour out His peace in us. He's just waiting for us to become still enough, calm enough, and focused on Him enough to feel His peace peace. Well, all of those attributes that we've already looked at had to do with ourselves, our love, our joy, our peace. The next attribute we need to look at has to do with other people, our reaction to them and how we treat them and how we respond to how they treat us. Yes, it's that nasty word called patience that we need to explore. Do you consider yourself to be a patient person? If so, maybe you should teach this lesson because I know this is one I struggle with. Oh, I want patience. The only problem is I want it right now. You see, we live in an instant society. Instant cereal, instant coffee, instant tea, and instant potatoes that we cook in an instant pot. How many of you are like me and you stand at the microwave and you tap your fingers because it just isn't cooking fast enough? We don't want to wait on anything anymore. The problem is that very few of the things we consume that are instant are as good as things that are cooked the old-fashioned way. But if instant is all we've ever consumed, we don't know what we're missing. If you never had the extreme privilege of tasting my mother-in-law's homemade macaroni and cheese, and that stuff that comes out of a box might taste okay to you because you don't know what you're missing. You know, this can be true with our spiritual life. 
How many of us have spent our entire life settling for an instant relationship with Jesus Christ? Instant scripture, instant prayers, and instant answers are just a few of the actions we think will bring us closer to Him. We breathe a quick prayer in the morning, telling the Lord what we need from Him today, and if there's time, we may even recite John 3.16. The sad thing about this scenario is that if that's all we've ever known, we don't know what we're missing. David shares with us these words in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. You see, David is telling us that Because he waited patiently for the Lord, he was rescued from his troubles, and the Lord put a new song in his mouth. Could it be that the reason we're often so tired and burned out is because we're living an instant life? Now, my husband and I have an interesting story as to how we met, and I won't bore you with all the details, but my mom actually introduced us. She had met Dan first and was so impressed with him that she was adamant that I meet him too. So we met. We had our first date in December. We were engaged in April and married in October. So what does this story have to do with being patient? I mean, our timetable doesn't sound like we had much patience, does it? Well, you see, there's one factor I didn't mention. Dan just happens to be six and a half years older than I am. So we always joke about the fact that when Dan thought the Lord should bring him the woman he was supposed to marry when he was 20 or 21, I was only 13 or 14. And you can get arrested for dating someone when they're that young. You see, if Dan wouldn't have been patient and wouldn't have waited for me to grow up, he wouldn't have gotten me. Now, most days I think he thinks that that was a good thing that he waited, but I'm sure there are those days that he wonders why he waited but we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary, so we feel we are very blessed. You know, I wonder sometimes, what is just around the corner in our life that's fantastic? But because we don't wait on the Lord for His timing, we miss out. For us to have patience, we need to realize that there is someone in control of this world and our life. We need to remember that God does work things together for good to those that love him. Lloyd Ogilvy once wrote that a patient person knows the shortness of time and the length of eternity. You see, patience is really faith in action. Our waiting on God's timing, having faith in the fact that he is in control, will result in an answer that will bring glory and honor to him. But waiting on God's timing isn't always on our agenda, is it? Think about it. For most of us, our lives are insane. Our schedules are crazy. We spend much of our time feeling like we're running around like chickens with our head cut off. We run here and there, and if we still have kids at home, we're running them to school or to practice and then back home to cool, quick throw a meal on the table or, or better yet, drive through McDonald's and Everyone scarfs down their food on the way to the next appointment. And by the time our day ends, we are exhausted and cranky, and we surely don't have patience left. It's no wonder that so many people are burned out and stressed to the max. And unfortunately, we're teaching our children that this is the way we should live because everyone's doing it. Forget quality family time. It's not happening in a lot of homes today. And I'll be honest, that scares me. We are living in an instant society and we don't have a clue how to wait patiently for anything and especially how to wait patiently for the Lord. So who are we to be patient with? Well, Ephesians 4.2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 reads, And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. 
The next time we find ourselves struggling to display patience with those around us, maybe it will help if we remember the shortness of time and the length of eternity. None of us know how long we're going to have on this earth. But if you look at the entire picture, each of us is here for just a short time. But eternity will go on forever. Our not allowing the Lord to work in His time may affect the eternal destination of those with whom you come in contact. Our reaction to everyday situations may turn someone on to Christ or turn them off. You see, turning somebody on to Christ will mean that that person will spend eternity with Him in heaven. Turning someone off by our attitude and our actions and our impatience and their rejection of Christ as their Lord and Savior means they're going to spend eternity in hell. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Remember that true patience comes as a result of having a deep personal relationship with Christ. We do not dare settle for instant Christianity. We have to be willing to spend time praying and studying the Bible. Patience is one of the characteristics of Christ, so the closer we become to Him, the more patient we will become. And the more patient we're going to become, the better example we're going to be to those who we come in contact with each day. There was an elderly woman who learned about patience. She and her husband had been married for more than 60 years. They had shared everything. They had talked about everything. They had kept no secrets from each other, except that the little old woman had a shoebox in the top of her closet that she had cautioned her husband never to open or ask about. Well, for all those years, he had never thought about the box. But one day, the little old woman got very sick, and the doctor said she probably would not recover. In trying to sort out their affairs, the little old man took down the shoebox and took it to his wife's bedside. She agreed it was time that he should know what was in that box. When he opened it, he found two crocheted doilies and a stack of money totaling $25,000. He asked her about the contents. When we were married, she said, my grandmother told me the secret of a happy marriage was to never argue. She told me that if I ever got angry with you, I should just keep quiet and crochet a doily. Well, the little old man was so moved, he had to fight back tears. Only two precious doilies were in that box. She had only been angry with him two times in all of those years of living and loving. Well, he almost burst with happiness. Honey, he said, that explains the doilies, but... What about all this money? Where did it come from? Oh, she said, that's the money I made from selling the doilies. You see, that woman had learned to live patiently and to make the most of what she had been given. The New Bible Dictionary defines patience as God-given restraint in the face of opposition or oppression. Patience is only necessary in the face of opposition. If everything's going along in the timetable that you want, you don't need patience. But because it is only necessary in the face of opposition, seeking patience is in many senses a battle. The promise we can lean on is that patience is God-given restraint. Not something that we just are or that we can produce in our own strength. The Lord is the one who provides us with the spiritual armor to go into battle. Our only responsibility is to trust that God will provide the strength to hold on. Our role is to trust the Holy Spirit in giving us the strength to persevere in whatever situation we find ourselves in. Waiting on God forces us to look to Him. It casts our eyes rightly to Christ as the source of our faith and the assurance of our salvation. It reminds us that Christ's death and resurrection are the reason we can be filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Trials cause us to persevere by 
by deepening our knowledge of God and relying on Him more intentionally. As James 1, 2-4 through 4 tells us, it is through trials that our faith grows to maturity. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. One thing we need to remember is that waiting patiently on the Lord does not mean being stuck at a standstill. We have available to us Christ's armor, which we can put on every day. We read in Ephesians 6, 10-17, A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of Christ's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We might feel unable to continue to wait patiently on God or or to continue to love those who may be hard to love. But in fact, we have access to all the patience we need in Christ. We can trust the Spirit to give us the strength to bear our circumstances and enable us to use this time of waiting to grow in our relationship with Him. And we know that this will make us look more and more like our Jesus. Thanks for joining me today. Make sure and subscribe to my channel, Image Seeker, so that you won't miss our next lesson on the fruit of the Spirit. Take care, and I will see you soon.